It is a wonderful day and it's so good to be here. What a beautiful time together to sing and pray and remember Jesus. And now we want to spend a few minutes in the Word of God together. If you would open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, you would be in the perfect spot for what we'll do for a few minutes this morning and also going into the evening. In fact, we started, for those who are visiting today, we started some discussion in Hebrews 10 last Sunday, and I want to pick up and reiterate a couple of little thoughts and then move through the rest of this text. But if you have your Bibles open there, you'll be in a great spot for almost everything we'll be doing. We picked out a phrase last Sunday morning that is found in verse 14, a beautiful idea that imperfect people like us who are destined for damnation by our own doings can be perfected. We can be made right and made righteous and not just now and today, but forever, for all time and into eternity. And all of this is made possible through Jesus and him alone. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10, by this we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It took nothing short of Jesus living in a body just like yours, denying the impulses of that body and sacrificing that body in order, verse 14, that by one offering his body, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now, for a portion of last week's study, we looked at what made this possible. And again, we've just said it. It was made possible through Jesus. There is much discussion in Hebrews chapters 8, 9, and 10 about the Old Testament. There were those who still wanted to live under the old law, but the old law perfected no one. The old law allowed for the forgiveness of no one. In fact, all of their sacrifices they did every year and their day of atonement was really just a reminder of their sin that perpetuated forward until Christ came to be the answer for everyone. It is such an optimistic, positive chapter about why we are Christians and in what we have our hope. But tucked in to this chapter are some extremely sobering ideas about sin. And not just the sin that an unperfected worldly person would commit, but the dangers of the sin of perfected people. That almost doesn't even make sense. If I've been perfected for all time, what's the big deal about my sin? Well, pick up with me in verse 26. He's writing to Christians, saved people like us. And he says, if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. What an intense warning that even believers like us who are perfected, Lord willing, forever, if we choose to sin willfully, if we decide to embrace it and not release it, then all that we have will be forfeit much like we saw in the case of Israel in Judah throughout their years. So it became an intense form of study for me to figure out what in the world does it mean to sin willfully because I don't want to do it. We know that we sin. There's no one in this room of any age looking at me saying, you know what, I think I'll just never sin again, so this won't be a problem for me. You need Jesus because there is sin that must be dealt with. But what is this willful sin? So we spent a lot of time last week talking about how the box checking method won't work. Is it just the accumulation of the good things I do versus the bad things? And if I do enough of the good things and few enough of the bad things, then I'll be okay. It's more than just the decisions that you make. It is what is behind the decisions that you make. What motivates the decisions that you make? A person properly spiritually motivated will still sin, but will never continue in sin if they're operating from the right place. So we spent our time in verses 19 through 24, and here's what we looked at. How do I avoid sinning willfully without even really describing what it is, because it's any number of things that defy God's will. How do I avoid doing it? And we came up with a list of things that we found in Hebrews 10. This is the kind of person that I must become. I must become the kind of a person who approaches God confident in his presence and on a consistent and ongoing basis. That person makes good decisions. The person who is not like that will make a lot of bad decisions. I have to be honest. 
honest about my sin, sincere about my weaknesses, full of faith and constantly seeking to be cleansed anew by him. You think that person will make good decisions? I like the odds for that person. The person who is saying, I need Christ and I will seek Christ and you will find him. The person who gives allegiance to professing, to verbally speaking our confession of hope in Jesus everywhere we go and amongst everyone that we meet, we speak of our hope and we'll live in hope. You want to know someone who's baptized, who's liable to go on sinning willfully and lose their soul? It's someone who doesn't use their lips to proclaim the name of Jesus. If I am the kind of person who is involved in daily discipleship and I'm not alone, I'm invested in God's people. That's verses 23 and 24 of the text from last week. If I'm invested in us, it's not just about me. It's about you also. And I'm here to serve in this family and to help us all. Like that's going to affect my decisions. Don't weigh yourself so much on the things that you do, because you'll do good things and you'll do bad things and you'll have to work on that. Weigh yourself more on what motivates the things that you do. Are you motivated by faith? By cleansing? Are you motivated by what your decisions will mean to our family here and how it will affect God's people? Those are the kinds of things that will keep you in Christ forever. Well, as we pick up on that a little bit more, I want to stick with it just a moment here. And I want to see if we can figure out, OK, that's that's great. I get it. Sincerity and prayer life and church love. Got it. But like, can you actually literally tell me what sinning willfully is? I want to know what the sins are. And this is where we make our list, right? We're like, well, you've got to attend this many times in a given month and, and you have to read your Bible this often and, and you have to watch, you know, this rating of movie, but not that rating of movie. And we want to make these like box lists. All those are important. But man, let me show you. There is something much, much deeper and more important going on in the life of a Christian than just should I watch that? Should I say this or should I do that? Let's read it together. I need you in Hebrews 10. We did not talk about it last week. This is all new information. I'm going to read verses 26 through 31. I want you to see if you can pick out the three things that constitute even a previously saved believers submission to the devil's will. Let's read it. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice of sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy, that inferior law. You set that aside, you're in trouble on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much, verse 29, how much severer punishment. Do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? Verse 30, for we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Okay, here's some truth. When you face Jesus, chances are there will be vast imperfections in your life. Chances are Jesus is going to look at you and say, you could have done better, sir. And he would be right about that. Chances are there will still be sins that I am fighting when I see Jesus. And he will sanctify me anyway. He will receive me anyway. Because if perfection is what is needed, then access will always be denied. But there will be some. Some who worship in churches ju just like this, who sing out on Sundays just like you've done. There will be some who approach him one day and say, I'm imperfect and I know I make mistakes, but take me in. And Jesus is going to say, not those mistakes. Those are the mistakes that have cost you everything. What are they? Number one, you chose to trample me under your feet as you walked over me to get to the things that you wanted to do. Is that descriptive? I feel like that's excessively descriptive. It's almost violent, isn't it? 
to push Jesus down and to step on him to get to what I want to do. You say, I would never do that. He said, that is what sinning willfully is. When there's something in your life that you want so bad that you're, you're a Christian and everything, but you crave it. Maybe it's words you want to say or things you want to do or look at or, or be about. And you go after it instead of Jesus. You think, well, I'm a Christian who's just doing dumb things. Jesus says, you're stepping on my face with your shoes. That's graphic. You want to be someone who doesn't sin willfully? Think about who's under your boots with the next steps that you take. If I step this way, who will I have to step on in order to get there? That will change everything about the way you make decisions. It'll change the way you speak and think and walk. But you've got to look down and see who's getting trampled so that I can get there. That's a huge way of looking at sinning willfully. All of us who go to heaven will go with sin, but we will not willfully step on our Lord to get there. Number two. This is more relevant to kind of what's going on in the text because the text is about the blood of bulls and goats that only kind of pacified the sins in God and, and served as a reminder. But then Jesus comes, we read about it back in verse 10 and he offered his body. And you go back to chapter nine and verse 26, just turn back a page. In chapter nine and verse 26, he would have needed to suffer, etc. It says he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrificing of himself. Jesus died so that you could be free from sin. Hebrews 10 says, you want to know what sinning willfully is? It is looking at the shed blood of Jesus and saying that is not good enough. It's not good enough. Your blood doesn't mean enough. To me. I know it's great and I'm thankful for it. And remember, the blood of Jesus did two important things, not just one. First of all, it established a new law. Yes, law with rules, his rules, authority rules. It established a new set of standards for life and it purified you of all your sins so that you could be righteous on that walk. You know what sinning willfully is? Sinning willfully is saying, Jesus, I don't care. It's not good enough to stop me. I can't change my habits just because you died on a cross. Now, no one's ever said that. I mean, you've never said that, right? No one's ever said, I am too addicted to this thing. Jesus, I don't care about your... No one's ever said that. But everyone who still sins willfully is doing that. That's what we're doing. Do you see how it changes your conduct when you get behind what the action itself is and you start looking at what is really happening when you're doing that thing? It changes everything about the thing that you do. The third one that goes along with it is this. He says, when we sin willfully, what we're doing is we're incurring severe punishment because we trample the Lord and we insult his blood, but we also insult the spirit of grace. This is an interesting one to me. Here's what we learn in the New Testament, and you may believe this is literally true, or you may believe it's figuratively or spiritually or something else that ends with L-L-Y. But the text says that when we become Christians, the Holy Spirit starts dwelling in us. In fact, 1 Corinthians 6 says your physical body is a temple. Jackson, good to see you. Your physical body is a temple. And when you became a Christian, the Holy Spirit came to dwell in your temple. I read Romans 8 yesterday. Anybody read Romans 8? It was a part of our reading this week we have in the back. It talks about how the Holy Spirit dwells in you. That means where you go, who goes with you? The Holy Spirit. When you participate in something, who are you making to participate with you? The Holy Spirit. And so this idea is, if I decide, you know what, I've got the spirit in me, but I'm going to take him places he doesn't want to go. I'm going to ask him to do things he doesn't want to do. Spirit, just sit in the background for a minute. I've got to do this. I will lose my soul forever for insulting the spirit. Uh, any of you raised or raising uh, teenage daughters? Anybody? You tell your daughter, you're going to go out with that guy. You're going to go out with that guy. You make sure he respects you. If he respects you, he will only take you to the right places. If he respects you, he will not put you in a situation that compromises what you believe in. If he cannot respect you, you should not be with him. Gentlemen, do we know that speech? You are taking the Holy Spirit with you. Respect him. 
If we take him places he doesn't want to go and make him to do things he doesn't want to do, his father will say, I am removing him from you, sir. I will remove my spirit. Man, when I think about that, it makes me re-envision all of these little steps that I take and things that I do. They're not just decisions I'm making. They are spiritual ideas coming to fruition by the decisions that I'm making. And so if you want to alleviate sin in your life, ask yourself the big questions. Who's under my feet when I take this step? What does this say about a dying Messiah on the cross when he had me in mind as he did it? And if the spirit is with me, is the spirit happy that we're here? This can go on the positive side, too. Like, I don't know what y'all are going to be doing this evening. I'm probably going to be in worship with Christians. And I think the spirit's going to be like, thumbs up to that. That's exactly what I love to do. As opposed to taking him to places that he loves less. Those are the kind of decisions that shape us. Now, what I really love about this, and we need to move to something else, something that we'll, we'll walk into for the rest of today and, and also into the evening, is one of the really great things about this is it begins to draw our attention away from the physical into the spiritual. Do you see that from the, the wording here? It begins to get you to think beyond the physical decision you're about to make or, or the literal usage of your body. And it asks you to see something more, something higher. It asks you to see God on his throne and the son of God beside him and, and the Holy Spirit and his work. And it draws our attention in the right places. And it helps us to look and see how does God feel when I do this and how does it, it affect him? And that leads us to something that I want to talk about for a few minutes. If this is something that you're struggling with, then you're not alone. I mean, all of us, I think, want to sin less. I don't want to sin. I want to do the will of God. And, and if I could stay very, very focused on these spiritual ideas every day, I know I would do better. How can I do that? How can I get focused more on what is right? I want to show that to you. And to help, we need to do a little bit of reading. So go to Hebrews 10. And right after he gets done with this little discourse in verse 31, it says it'd be a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God, having done these things. He finishes the section with this, verses 32 through 39. I want to give you one idea to finish with today. He says, remember the former days, Hebrews 10, 32, when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming shares with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you had for yourselves, now this is key, a better possession and a lasting one. I'm going to pause a moment because I think you saw it. This kind of language isn't just, should I go to this bad place and do this bad thing? That's not really even what this text is about. It's not, oh, I shouldn't do that because the Holy Spirit doesn't want to do that. This text is about, are you willing to endure sufferings? Are you willing to sacrifice for your faith? Are you willing to give up things, to lose things, to abandon things because you don't want to insult the spirit in yourself? It's a very heavy handed concept. They were able to do it. Verse 34, because they had their mind set on a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, verse 35, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised for yet in a very little while. He who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back from faith, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preser preserving or preservation of your souls. I want to show this to you. This is the last slide. I'm going to give you a few things here and then talk about it for a little while. Is there one thing that I can do every day that can help me live better by focusing on just that? I think the answer is yes, but I need to walk into it slowly. I want to remind you, it's very important for me to remind you that a covenant change has taken place. I think you know this. If you've ever read Hebrews 9 and 10, if you were here last week, you were very thankful that a covenant change took place. They used to live under the law of Moses with its 630 rules and they had to offer animal sacrifices and it didn't even really help them in a spiritual sense. And if I ask anybody here, raise your hand if you want to finish out your walk under the law of Moses with incomplete sacrifices, nobody would raise their hand. Everybody in this room is thankful that that law and its concepts for righteousness are gone and they have been replaced. Well, I need to show you something then. Because there is something about the law of Moses that has been replaced that is a little harder for us to get. The blood sacrifices is easy. Bad, good. 
less, more. Animals, Jesus. Let me show you something that's a little bit tougher. Big words today. Home educated, but I've been working on it. Big words, all right? But I need you to see them. Have you ever heard of the book of Deuteronomy? I think everybody knows about that book. Deuteronomy is a book that gives you the old law in great detail. Before they entered into the land, they were given the law. Are you familiar with the Deuteronomistic? Ooh, I practiced that a lot and I got it. I may not try it again. One more time. Are you familiar with the Deuteronomistic view of the law of Moses? All right, check this out. It's really simple. Everything's physical. You physically do the right thing so you get a physical reward. If you obey your parents, you get to live a long time. If you don't obey your parents, you die. If you do what God says, you get a house to live in. If you don't do what God says, you lose your house. If the nation obeys the law of God, then the nation gets to be a nation and have a beautiful city to live in. If you do not follow the law of God, then somebody else comes and attacks your city and takes it away. Everything's very carnal. I do the right thing physically, I get a physical reward. I don't do the right thing physically, then that reward is taken away. That's the way it was under the law of Moses. It explains a lot about how their law worked and nations and wars. Jesus came and said that is no longer the case. He replaced the Deuteronomy, you know, view he replaced the physical good equals physical reward with if you obey me now in the flesh, it is apocalyptical in nature. I will give you an eternal home later. Is that different? Hugely different. Now you may get to keep your house or you may lose your house. You may live a long time or you may die tomorrow. We may win the next war or we may lose the next war and it will not be mutually connected to your righteousness. In fact, because you are righteous, because you choose the truth, you may actually lose your homes. You say, oh, I, don't, I don't like where this is going. Well, that's what he just said. He said you had the forfeiture of your property. Uh, they beat you. There were people who were put to death. Because you choose right, you may live a shorter life. Some of you are going, can we get back to that old law? Because I like that better. You know, sometimes I think I might like that better. Do right, live a long time. Do right, have a house. Jesus said, do right, may lose your house. Do right, may live a short time. Do right, and you may even see your nation crumble right in front of you. But I am promising you something more. I'm asking you to draw your view past today, past the flesh, and look into the courts of heaven and live for eternal life. And it's all over the text. He said in verse 34, the reason they're able to do this is because they want a better possession. He says, verse 34, they want a lasting one. He says in verse 35, they're not living for monetary, physical, or earthly re rewards, but a great reward. He said, you have to endure so that you can get, verse 36, what was promised. What was promised has very little to do with your flesh or America or the next World Series. Very little to do with that. It has everything to do with what is beyond this life. In fact, he spells it out in case you're missing the point. In verse 39, he finishes with faith in the preserving of the soul. Let me add something to the chart. I think we struggle with this. I think this is a pretty tough change. I think we're kind of, I use the term hedging our bets sometimes. I think we're going, yes, yes, I'm living for heaven, but also this life needs to be a good one. Yes, I want to be with God in heaven. We sing all the songs. That's really cool. But I've got some things I need to focus on here right now to get what is mine. I have news for you. It's sobering, but that's been the nature of today's lesson. You can't really pursue both and get both. You have to decide, like, do I live for this flesh and getting and gaining? Because a lot of the sinning that Christians do, you say, why do Christians sin? Why do Christians sin? We're living for heaven. Why are we sinning? Is when our view goes like this, ready? It goes, oh God, you're so great. And then we go, and then we go find a mirror and we go, and we see this flesh and this life and we start making decisions that prioritize my flesh, my health, my life, our money. 
what we get to keep how much joy we get to incur. And if we have a Deuteronomistic view of the kingdom, we will never see the kingdom. And God talks a lot about this. Go with me in, uh, in your New Testament. Just turn back a few pages. We're coming back. But turn back to Colossians 3. Isn't this his point in Colossians 3? His point is you have to start living for heaven or you will not be able to make these decisions consistently. What I'm saying is I think there are members of the church who want to make better decisions, but where their eyes are cast, those decisions aren't possible for you right now. I sure wish I could prioritize God's people over myself. I sure wish I could be a better Bible student. I sure wish that I was more focused on, on confessing Jesus than defending myself. Look, if your gaze is set this way, you can't get there from here. But here's something that Christians agreed to do. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, if you have been raised up with Christ, Colossians 3, verse 1, I've been raised up with Christ. I've been baptized into Christ. I came up out of the water. I ended an earthly focus and I started a spiritual walk. Keep seeking things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died. Died to what? Died to anything reward-based here. You know, that's what it's like before you're a Christian. There is no kingdom. There is no heaven. There is no spirituality. There's just, I'm going to go out and live the best life I can and get the most I can for it. Okay, that's the way you live when you're not a Christian. He said, you decided that that's not what this is anymore. I died to a life that was focused on physical exchange as purpose. And my life is now hidden with Christ in God. And here's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about Christ, who is my life, and his revelation. And then I will be revealed with him in glory. You know what that means? I'll get my reward then. I need you to say it to yourself. I will get my... I make sacrifices. Life is hard. I have to discipline my body. I make difficult choices. I give up things the world gets to do. I will get my reward later. You say, are you saying you won't get any rewards now? No, God is actually like good on top of good. I think there are rewards for good behavior here. But if you think that that's what you're promised, then you will start to modify your behavior until you start getting the good things. Are you with me? I know it's all about heaven, but I think also God should be blessing my life here. Good money, good job, good things, good favor. So I'll start modifying my walk until I start getting the things. Well, guess where that walk's going to take you? Away from God. We live under a heaven-focused view. Now go back to Hebrews 11. I want to show you something neat. We're going to get into Hebrews 11 just a little bit now, a little bit more tonight. Hebrews chapter 11, we know really well. It's the chapter on faith. We need to live with the faith of Noah and Moses and Abraham and all those wonderful people. I want you to start noticing, starting in Hebrews chapter 11, that Hebrews 11 is not a faith chapter as much as it is an eternal life chapter. It's not so much a chapter on here's what I do and what I don't do and good people do this and bad people do that. It's more about a group of people who are living for heaven and because they were living for heaven, they made really good decisions. OK, you got we got to flip it. It's not go out and try to make good decisions. And then one day we'll talk to you about heaven. It's focus on heaven and you'll make those good decisions. Verse one, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. What's he talking about? He's talking about heaven. Christ in heaven, the preserving of our souls in verse thirty nine. Hebrews 11, verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that God is and that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. What does that mean? Good health? Live to be 100? Rangers finally get it done? You ought to live to be 200. That's not the reward, folks. If you think the reward is here, you will modify your walk to get to the rewards. And it won't be God's walk. The text is talking about the reward of heaven. He goes on to talk about this in verse 10. He talks about Abraham, how Abraham left his homeland and Abraham lived in tents, lived out his whole life on property that didn't belong to him. Why? For he was looking for the city. Where is his view? He was looking for the city which had foundations, 
whose architect and builder is God. And this is a neat revelation. You say, well, in the Old Testament, it was all about physical exchange. Now, Christ came in with this apocalyptical view, and it's all about heaven. Hey, I got news for you. It's actually always been about heaven. Abraham lived for heaven. Abraham was focused on eternity. The Old Testament doesn't say a lot about eternity because the law of Moses came. And honestly, I'll just give you an opinion view. Why did God institute a 1500 year law of Moses that traded in the do good and get heaven with do good and keep breathing oxygen? Like, why did he change that? Why did he go, forget this a minute, let's just focus on this? Because honestly, I think it was the only way to keep a hard headed nation going long enough to get us to Jesus. He had to, in order to get them, listen carefully, in order to get the Israelites to obey him, he had to trade in physical reward for physical godliness. And he had to trade physical punishment for physical sin. That has never been God's plan for you. God's plan has always been spiritual, holy, eternal, because even Abraham was looking for this wonderful land. Go to verse 13. All these, Sarah, Abraham, Noah, we've seen so far, Abel, Enoch, this whole list. All these, verse 13, died in faith without receiving the promises. They didn't get anything for it. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they're seeking a country of their own. That's heaven, folks. That's eternal life. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. The last thing I would just put here is the point of it all. We, we know we need to focus on Jesus. That's what all this is about at the top. We need to focus on how does this affect Jesus? What does it mean to Jesus? How am, who, is he under my feet or am I lifting him up? But also, I just need to ask you, like, how often do you think about eternal life? You say, oh, I think about it every day. Let me rephrase my question. How often during the decision making parts of your life? Are they previewed with a view of eternal life? How does this decision affect my eternal journey? How does this decision affect what I'm really here for? Does this decision say that this is my home or that is my home? Because you're going to have to make those kinds of choices. This is going to have to be an alien. You're going to do things that are weird, that the world thinks are completely upside down. But Christ came to build an upside down kingdom, didn't he? One that shows growth through submission and humility. I found it interesting, time fails this year, but verse 21, I just found it interesting that Jacob, as he was dying, Joseph, as he was dying, verse 23, Moses, as he was born, and also verse 24, as he was growing up. And here's why I'm saying that. From birth to death, it is always about something more. From birth to death, it was about something bigger, something spiritual, and something holy. And this helps us explain the end of the chapter. Look at verses 32 and following. What more shall I say? For time would fail me if I tell you about Gideon and Barak. I'm in Hebrews 11:32, 32, and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel. And man, they conquered kingdoms and performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lion, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put away foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. He said, time would fail me if I told you about all the people on this earth who did the right thing and got blessed, this is going to circumvent or undermine my point for a moment. They did what was right and God blessed them in this life. I mean, that's what that is, right? God blessed Daniel by not dying. And you say, well, maybe your theory is wrong. Maybe God really is saying, let's get out there and make this life great. You do good, I'll make it good for you here. But then you keep reading and everything flips on its head. He said, but there were others who wouldn't even accept their release while being tortured so that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings, verse 36, scourgings, chains, imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins, goatskins, destitute, affliction, and ill treatment. Men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in the deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Well, there's the other side of it. 
a great many people made very difficult decisions and they lost their things here. They lost their lives. You say, there's nothing more important than my life. Oh, there is something more important than your life. Your soul is eminently more important than your life. And they forfeited length of life here. They refused to be released from prison because they believed in something more. He said they did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. God made a heavenly spiritual promise. A couple of things I want to say as we close. This is not easy. It takes meditation and reading and sitting quietly and thinking and processing. If you go on autopilot this week, you just get up in the morning, have your cup of autopilot coffee and off you go. You will have a transactional week where you make physical decisions because of physical results. I and mean, that's, that's, our, that's our pre-mode. We go out, I'm going to go to church tonight. If I think it's going to physically be good for me, I'm going to stay home. If I don't, uh, tomorrow I'm going to say this. If I think it's going to physically work. And then that's, that's your default. That's the way the world lives. It's the way the law of Moses governed their insecurities and their sin. But God is asking you to set your gaze on something more and keep it there. How will this affect my walk? Is this helping me get to heaven or not? And can I talk about our kids for a minute? Am I raising my children to overqualify for heaven? Am I raising them to understand that every step our family takes, every, I mean, we do make physical decisions and we try to enjoy our lives here, but only if those steps help us get to heaven. I'm working on a lesson for in a few weeks to preach in, uh, at Camber Road Church, if it works out now, and I'm back in Matthew 25. You guys remember Matthew 25 where Jesus says, I'm coming back one day. I'm coming back one day and I don't know what kind of life you're going to be living or who's going to be under your feet or where you're going to be. But when I come back, I'm going to separate the sheep and I'm going to put on my right all the faithful and I'm going to put on my left all of the unfaithful and I'm going to take all of you to heaven forever and ever eternally and these will be lost. And in that chapter, he says, you want to know who's who? Who wants to know? Who wants to know if you're going to be on his right or on his left? And do you remember the three things? He said, there are people in this life who are not only filling their lamps with oil, they keep filling their lamp with oil. They're over preparing to meet me one day. Is that you? Are you over preparing to meet Jesus? You're not just kind of preparing and hopefully you'll come on a Sunday morning. Like you're over preparing. You're filling it up because only thing that really matters is when he comes back, it's got to be full. That's heavenward thinking. Remember he talked about the talents? He said, when I come back, there's going to be people who have their talent buried in the ground. Well, at least I got that talent you gave me 30 years ago. He's going to say, you think I care about that? When I come back, there will be people increasing their talents. There will be people growing, changing and multiplying the things that they can do. Those people are focused on heaven. When he gets back, I want to be running when he gets here. I know we get tired. I know we get disappointed. I know family lets us down. Brethren sometimes let us down and we let ourselves down. But if you're living for heaven, you just keep growing because you know he's coming back. And then the last thing, you know, you guys know I talk about it a lot. Matthew 25, he said, you guys are going to be really surprised when I come back one day. You're going to think I'm supposed to save all those people and cast all those people. And I'm going to end up saving a bunch of both of these. And you're going to say, God, why did you save these and not those? He's going to say, because I was hungry and thirsty and sick, and in need, and in prison, and destitute, and you fed me, and you gave me water, and you helped me, and you sacrificed for me, and you put me on your animal, and took me to the inn, and gave them to you, you guys know where I'm going. Are we over preparing and constantly preparing to face Jesus? Because if we are, we will be using this life to serve other people. We will take the money we have in the bank and we will use it to help other people. We will take our freedoms and our opportunities and our mouths and we will use it to serve other people. You say, well, that means I'm not going to get everything I would have gotten. Yeah, that's exactly what it means. It means I'm not going to get to do everything I wanted to do. Bingo. Now you're getting warmer. It means I may have to sacrifice for others. If I had a bell, I'd ring it. Those people are ready for heaven. 
A lot of people in churches sitting on what they got, thinking that it's all about holding where they are. It's not about growing. It's about not dying. It's not about filling. It's about not losing that last quart in the bottom. Those people aren't ready. You need to cast your view upward because those who living, are living for heaven are filling, growing, and serving. And they're waiting. Are you waiting for Jesus? We're going to get back in this tonight. Hebrews 12 is going to help us a little bit more. But for now, I simply want you to think about the moment Jesus comes back, what that's going to be like. If heaven is all you're here for, if you miss heaven, Brother D. Bowman always said, it's written on his, his tombstone, his gravestone. If you miss heaven, you've missed all that there is. One day, everybody's going to know that. How many will be ready for it? If that needs to be you, step forward in faith with your eyes cast upon the horizon as we stand together and sing.